We can see on our planet many very strange features that can now be linked together and systematically explained as a result of a cataclysmic global flood whose waters erupted from subterranean chambers with an unimaginable amount of explosive energy. This explanation shows how major mountains formed very quickly. It explains our coal, oil, and methane deposits, rapid continental drift, why we find on the ocean floor huge trenches, hundreds of canyons, and tens of thousands of volcanoes. It explains the formation of the layered strata and almost all fossils, the frozen mammoths, the so-called ice ages, and major land canyons, especially the Grand Canyon. The pre-flood Earth probably had only one very large supercontinent covered with lush vegetation. There were seas and rivers. The mountains were smaller than today, perhaps 5,000 feet high. According to the hydroplate theory, about half the water that is now in our oceans was originally contained in interconnected subterranean chambers. This water formed a thin spherical shell at least a mile thick, perhaps 60 miles below the surface of the pre-flood earth. Increasing pressure in the subterranean water stretched the crust just as a balloon stretches when the pressure inside increases. Failure in the crust began with a microscopic crack which grew in both directions at about two miles a second. This crack following the path of least resistance encircled the globe in about three hours. As the crack raced around the earth, the overlying rock crust opened up like a rip in a tightly stretched cloth. The subterranean water was under extreme pressure because of the weight of the 60 miles of rock pressing down on it. So the water exploded violently out of this rupture. All along the globe encircling crack, fountains of water jetted supersonically into and far above the atmosphere. The spray from this enormous fountain produced torrential rain such as the Earth has never experienced before or after. The Bible states that all the fountains of the great deep burst open on one day, and it describes these events about 5,000 years ago that we can now tie together scientifically in cause and effect order. Some of the water jetting high above the stratosphere froze into supercooled ice crystals and produce massive ice dumps, burying, suffocating, and instantly freezing many animals, including the frozen mammoths of Siberia and Alaska. The high pressure fountains eroded the crumbling rock on both sides of the crack, producing huge volumes of sediments that settled out of this muddy water all over the earth. These sediments trapped and quickly buried plants and animals, forming the fossil record. Vegetation uprooted by the floodwaters accumulated in certain regions where it was buried and compressed, rapidly becoming our coal, oil, and methane deposits by processes we can duplicate in the laboratory today. Eventually, the rupture became so wide that the newly exposed compressed rock beneath the subterranean chamber sprung upward, giving birth to the mid-oceanic ridge that wraps around the earth like a seam of a baseball. The continental plates, the hydroplates, with lubricating water still beneath them, slid downhill away from the rising mid-Atlantic ridge. After the massive, slowly accelerating continental plates reached speeds of well over 60 miles an hour, they ran into resistances and like a crashing continental-sized train, compressed, crushed, and buckled. As the continents crushed and thickened, they rose out of the floodwaters. The portions of the hydroplates that buckled down formed ocean trenches. Those that buckled up formed mountains. This is why the major mountain chains are generally parallel to the oceanic ridges from which they slid. This also explains why today's continents do not have a jigsaw fit against each other as so many textbooks mistakenly claim. Instead, the continents would fit much better against the sides of the mid-Atlantic ridge from where the continental drift began. The hydroplates 
and sliding away from the mid-Atlantic ridge opened up very deep ocean basins into which the floodwaters eventually drained. This movement and the resulting compression and buckling was so cataclysmic that it occurred within a single day. Immediately after the flood, sea level was considerably lower than it is today. So land bridges connected every continent. This allowed people and animals to spread and repopulate the post-flood Earth. As the thickened continents slowly sank into the Earth's mantle, the new and very deep ocean floors had to rise in compensation for the downward flow of mass. Therefore, sea level slowly rose for a few centuries after the flood and eventually reached today's level. As sea levels rose, river channels were drowned, channels that had been cut down to the lowered sea level by the heavy drainage after the flood. This explains the famous submarine canyons that are extensions of our rivers such as the Amazon, the Congo, the Indus, the Hudson, and the Ganges. Because some submarine canyons are almost three miles below today's sea level, we can conclude that sea level and some sea floors were about three miles lower than today. The rising sea eventually flooded the natural bridges and produced the look of the continents as we see them today, separated by water. As the floodwaters drained off the continents, every continental basin was naturally left brimful of water, producing many post-flood lakes. Because of local conditions, some of these lakes simply dried up. Others continued to collect water from rainfall and drainage from higher elevations. Sometimes a large lake spilled over its rim at the lowest point, eroding a notch. If the rim wall was composed of sediments that were still soft, the escaping water quickly enlarged and deepened the notch. As the volume and speed of the rushing water increased, so did its eroding power until the entire lake surged through a deep slit, forming a canyon. The largest canyon formed by this process is the Grand Canyon in Arizona. North and east of the Grand Canyon was a huge lake that I identified in 1987 and named Grand Lake. Grand Lake held twice the volume of water that is in Lake Michigan. Grand Lake spilled over its rim and carved this spectacular funnel 20 miles south of Page, Arizona, catastrophically forming the Grand Canyon within a few weeks and leaving a living testament to this terrible global flood which can be studied in person today.